So dad, of course, got to have you on the podcast because I want to ask you all these questions. I thought we'd start from the beginning. Sure. And the first question I have is, what was it like growing up in your family? You live downtown in Spokane and mom and dad, and you have four siblings. You're second out of five. You're Japanese American. What's it like growing up in your family? First of all, I had great parents, hardworking, humble parents, proud parents. They both wanted, according to my mom, at least five kids, hmm. which they, they did. Isn't that what you told mom when you first started dating, that you wanted at least five kids? <laughs> I, I think we, we may have some discussion about that. I don't know if it, the magic number was five. Yeah. But it was a lot. Yeah, we both, both of us, we came from fairly large families. Yeah. Mom said it was a, a green flag, meaning that she was encouraged by the two of you having that in common, that you both wanted to have a lot of kids. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think that was one of the things that um, mm, we both saw eye to eye on early on and just the family and, oriented. Yes. Yeah. Family was important to both of us and still is. Mm -hmm. So when we get family gatherings or mom is all for it, she, mm -hmm. she really we all looks are. forward to it. And yeah, yeah. we're so, so blessed that um, all of our family looks forward to getting together. Yeah. I, so you at Thanksgiving will get us all in a big circle, holding hands and we'll go around the room and give thanks for what we're thankful for each of us. And I always joke around and say that it looks like some sort of cult meeting, but it's a very touching thing. And you're not super extroverted to begin with. So it's this departure in a sense that you would, because in the beginning, when you first started instituting this tradition 10, 15 years ago or something, there were some grumblings from the younger kids. They were like, oh, we got, you know, because there's some nervousness around it. Now it's just a given that everyone sort of knows is going to happen. But it, it's a really special thing. And what I often think, give thanks for it, is that in our family, which I think is different than other families, and sure, certainly there are other families like this, but I think there are many families that aren't like this where we always show up for everything, whether it's holidays or birthdays or graduation or someone's in the hospital or a baby shower or a wedding. Or, like, there's just no question and no grumbling, no complaining. I witness other people, when they'll talk about obligations for family, they'll say things like, oh, got to go home because, you know, mom's going to pressure me to be there for Thanksgiving and I'd rather not be there because, you know, my mom's going to criticize me about, and I believe them, I, I don't disparage them for that, but it really says something about our family and our dedication and, and I feel like you really led the way. You know, mom did too, but I think you came from a family that always showed up. Mom's family was more disjointed for some obvious reasons, but for you and your siblings and your parents, it was always just a given that everyone was there and it was a good time. <laughs> it wasn't problematic in any way. There wasn't the drunk uncle or <laughs> the politically problematic grandma. But I, I want to get back to when you were a kid. So what was it like you know, you have an older brother, Gary, that's just a couple years older. Yes. Who was kind of the star of the family, right? Yeah. He correct. was the smart one and the athletic one and the outgoing one. Yes, all of those things. And you were what? Um, a little more withdrawn, <laughs> a little more shy. Yeah. He kind of led the way. Yeah. Obviously. We knew that in our family and in, in typical Asian families, firstborn son is gets a lot of attention. Yeah. So that tradition kind of carried on in our family and other families that I knew, not to the point that it was carried out in Japan, where it was just assumed that the, the oldest male would get everything, really, mm -hmm. would assume the leadership roles. Um, once the family's father and mother were no longer the leaders, it was up to the oldest son to carry on the, the uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In some ways, I guess you did because, you know, Gary moved to California yes, and yeah. stayed there yeah. for his life. Yeah. But you were at least close by being in Seattle, which isn't, you know, which is a five hour drive from Spokane. Yeah. So you were the one that kind of took that role over as an adult. 
Yes, that's true. Once my brother moved to Los Angeles and had a great teaching career down there, for us and here in the Northwest, I wanted to continue the traditions that my mother and father had established through the years. Yeah, established. What sort of traditions? Uh, you know, like at Thanksgiving time, Christmas time, those kinds of things. And so for me, family was very, very important, still is. My feeling is, you know, I mean, situations may change, uh, jobs, uh, whatever. The one thing that can remain consistent is family. Mm -hmm. The one thing that you can count on that uh, no matter what, you're going to be available mm -hmm. to support whatever it is. <laughs> I'd like to share a little story about raising you kids. Mm -hmm. For me and mom, one thing that would bond us all was I wanted to expose you kids to a lot of the sports so that you could make a decision on which sport you would like. And if you wanted to continue it, you know, I, I wanted to give you choices, football, basketball, baseball, track. Track was the first one that we introduced you to. <laughs> <clears throat> you had two older siblings that were uh, established in a traveling track club. Mm -hmm that we had in Issaquah. Six, seven years older than me. So, yes. So I was... Yes, and so you'd be tagging along and you'd and, have and to I come. And I was the... There was no one my age on the track team, actually. Yeah, you were... Well, there may have been just Well, there one. was another kid and he yeah. was a year older. Yeah. And then the next kid was like a year older than that. So yeah. it was an odd inclusion. I think even in the league, I, I don't think there were other teams that even had yeah. kids typically that were my age. But yeah. but I just wanted to be a part of the whole thing, I guess. Oh, yeah, definitely. we do this, um, it'd be virtually all day Saturday for the different age groups running their sprints. And I remember one time where you were kind of telling me that you were like, uh, I'm okay if I don't run. But I thought, no, you're here. We traveled... <laughs> An hour and a half to get here. Oh, so I arrived at the meet. Yeah. And I am trying to get out of well, competing. Yeah, you, 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 you just kind of let me know that running wasn't your, your thing. <laughs> but I was looking in, uh, the big picture was that, yeah, track may not be your thing right now. But I want you to run to understand what competition is all about. And yeah, you don't win all the time, but you keep trying to improve right i don't think i ever won i think <laughs> i think i was far from winning uh often and i think eventually i switched to shot put and i think i was okay at that because i was big for my age yes correct we wanted to be supportive of all you kids and for you your first venture into sports i just knew that track was going to help you in whatever sport you selected yeah it's I interesting i didn't know that you had that thought and you would have that theme throughout my childhood of thinking about, well, this sport will help you with this, you know, like with wrestling, you would say it helps you with balance and body awareness such that it can help you play football. Because you, I think, knew, and I might have indicated as such, that football was my main sport and wrestling was important to me, but not as important as football. And, and playing playing football enhanced your ability in wrestling. You, you would often try to provide that, that uh, perspective. Um, another perspective that you had about sports was that the lessons you learn on the field or on the mat or on the court or on the track, you will be able to apply those lessons in life. Do you remember instilling that in us? Yes. It teaches you that things are not always going your way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It uh, prepares you for a lot of things. Yeah. It teaches you good sportsmanship, obviously, working with a team, within a team concept. And also, there's sports where you're, you're on your own. That's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're, you control your own destiny. No, it's not your line blocking or, or uh, quarterback throwing the wrong passes. or It's just you. Yeah, I didn't like that. Wrestling was too stressful for me because of that. I was very stressed out about it because for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, it's just you under the spotlight with another opponent. Yep. But with the others, with the team sports, I didn't dread it at all. You know, there might be a big game coming up, but I looked forward to games, really. But with wrestling, it was, uh, it was very stressful. But anyway, you, you talked about how, where, where did you get that from? Where'd you get that value from of the lessons that you learn 
in sports will translate into helping you later in life? Where'd you get that from? I'm not sure. Of course, my father was, you know, an excellent baseball player. Mm -hmm. And um, football player. And football player, yes. And, uh, and basketball. Didn't he play basketball too? He did play basketball. I don't know how well. good he was in basketball. Okay. But Gary was good. Your older brother. Yeah, my brother was a good athlete. So I had something to look up to, obviously. Yeah. I think I surprised my father and my, my brother when I was able to at least beat, probably exceeded their expectations for me, hmm. which was, was nice. I had to work hard. So when you were younger, hard. they didn't think you would amount to much as an athlete, but then you managed to do so? Yes. Oh. Yeah. When I was younger, I was... I was just happy staying inside reading comic books or drawing pictures. You know, the, I, I found out that, that I could draw, and I can still draw to the, today. Mm -hmm. So I had this God-given talent that allowed me to make a living. Mm -hmm. I can still do it, so that's satisfying. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that, yeah, you, I think you would have been, at your high school, you had a coach that was so well-respected in wrestling. Mm -hmm. And if you if you mentioned Isqua High School, there was uh, Mr. Wilson who had uh, produced so many state champs and stuff. state champs, and I just think you would have. I, I'm I'm sure that once you said, "That's it, I'm handing in my," he must have thought, "Oh my gosh!" But <clears throat> that winter, I got a call from freshman defensive backs coach who was coaching freshman basketball. And he oh I forgot he he was a football coach too. yeah he called me he called me and he says uh, Mr Honda he says I was just wondering uh, you would allow Kirk to play on the freshman basketball team and I said well it caught me by surprise obviously and he says I've been he said I've been talking to some of the uh, kids who are on the team and they would like Kirk to be on the team so. We're asking for your permission to approach him and ask him if he wants to join the team. And, of course, I said, yeah, sure, that's fine. I loved basketball, and I had practiced so hard. And uh, As an our, adult, you were on a basketball team. Yes, yes. And, and you were good. Well, I was okay, but I had tried out for— Were you one of the best basketball players on your, on your adult rec team? On the team that's, that I played on? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I yeah. was— one of, yeah, one you were of like the best. point guard or something. Yeah, but after that phone call, I said, you know, here's a coach calling and asking, please, can you, can your son play basketball for our team? And I'm thinking, what? I I can't even imagine. If I would give my eye teeth for a to coach. play on the high school team. Yeah, we of course we had a big school. We had yeah upwards of like 3,000 kids at our high school. Yeah. And I tried out, and there must have been 100 kids. Yeah. And uh, I didn't make the cut. Oh, you did? No. Oh, well, you didn't? I didn't. Right. Yeah. So how did it feel when you didn't get on the team? Um, obviously disappointed. Yeah. So what was it, do you think, about your family or your upbringing or your dad that was it your own experience? Did, did your dad teach you this lesson that, sports were an important learning ground because a lot of people will play sports for other reasons for fun or to compete or scholarships or something but i remember fully believing and understanding and and i guess noticing the lessons that were being provided me on the field like you said like losing and working on a team and collaboration and dealing with frustration, knowing how to push yourself, knowing your limits, dedicating yourself to something, loyalty, chain of command even to the coaches and to the captains. I remember being cognizant of that. I didn't know how it would play out for me as an adult because I didn't know what adult life was like, but I do remember thinking that. And you would often say that. What, what was it? Where'd you get that from? I don't know. Um... I guess I don't know what inspired me to do that, but I wanted for you kids just to expose you to this. Um, did you learn lessons as a kid? Oh, I did, yes. What sort of lessons? Well, you, you learn that, yeah, you don't win all the time. Yeah. If it's a team game, 
you know, it's like, how can you improve the next time? You know, you have good coaches and, and some that are novices, so they're not quite as skilled in teaching drills and that kind of thing. So you accept that and you just realize that they're trying their best as everybody is. But as you know, as a football player, you can be uh, very talented. But if your line isn't blocking, if your line doesn't block, nothing works. Yeah. Nothing works yeah. on either side of the ball. I remember you being one of the larger kids growing up, and so you'd often play up where the kids were maybe two years older than you sometimes. And so because you were bigger, you, you were on the line, and you were doing a good job after about two years I talked to you and I said, okay, this year I want you to play linebacker because I want you to see what it's like standing up, mm-hmm. what that looks like. And um, Yeah, the for, coach, for those who don't know football, I played on the line, which means that in a nutshell, you don't see the whole field from that vantage point because you're in the scrum, you're in the mess of bodies. Yeah. Whereas linebacker, you start away from the line and your responsibilities are broader and being a linebacker you are kind of the quarterback of the defense yeah you have um, guys in front of you the line and guys in back of you so you suggested i play linebacker to um yeah to your coach you told the coach yeah i told was it tom collins at the time it was and because he just retired by the way oh okay yeah what a neat guy he was and um he didn't have any kids your age but he showed up every day and he was always so positive and a fun guy. He yeah. he was like an older brother in yeah. a lot of ways to us. Yeah. And wasn't afraid of swearing in the huddle, you know, he on a timeout he'd come out. And <laughs> I learned the old adage that excuses are like assholes, everyone has one but they stink. And um he comes into the huddle and he you know, he's yelling at someone and they have an excuse and he's like, Excuses are like assholes. <laughs> So, so you told him that, what, I might do well at linebacker or something? I just said that I want him, whether it's defensive end or whatever, I want you to be standing up. And, and then I thought, okay, we'll see how you like it at linebacker, see how that works. And then maybe, maybe move you into the backfield where you're safety or cornerback. or. Oh, really? Yeah, because I wanted you to, before high school, which mm-hmm. was maybe three years away, four years away, to experience what that's like. Because you played line. I did. Yeah. When I was a freshman, yeah. And when I became a running back as well, did you have a hand in that as well? No, I think they wanted to try you because of your agility and your size. They wanted to see, okay, let's let's see how you carry the ball. Yeah. They could see your potential. So by the time you got to high school, you, you had kind of seen it all. Yeah. And you could make those decisions. And that was the best of all worlds for me because, you know, you, you, you understood what was each position, mm-hmm. what they were required to do yeah. to make well, things work. It was similar to me being goalie and, and center forward in, in soccer. You coached us in soccer. Yeah. And I don't know how I became goalie. Exactly. Do you know how that happened? Um, did I just want to? Uh, you did not particularly like it. Oh, really? Um, I liked center forward better. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I recall a conversation we had when I was in the huddle and I was going to sub out. You told me, well, I don't want to play goalie. Oh, really? And I said, okay, no, you're going to play goalie. Really? And he says, oh, no, I don't want to play. And I says, you will. Why did you need me to play goalie? Um, We needed you. Yeah. Um, Did I have practice? Under me? Not really. We we had like three different people that we would use for goalie. Yeah. And you were kind of like the second choice. Okay. We had one that was fine with it and they would play goalie the people whole People didn't game. like goalie because it's boring or? Yeah. And especially for our team during that one year where we were just romping over every team. You, that, didn't, you didn't see any action. Yeah. Didn't the ball see. was always at the other yeah, end of the field. Right, yeah. right, right. Well, you had that middle linebacker kind of you know you weren't afraid of the ball right i remember that and and thinking well i want to play football 
uh, soon. I remember thinking that. And I thought, well, goalie's kind of like the closest to playing football because I can cream people if I want to. <laughs> I, the, the goalie has a lot more leeway regarding throwing their body around. And in that age group of soccer, there's a lot of bodies in the mix you know, it's not like the pros where there's a lot of separation between the guy that's taking the shot and the defenders. You know, there tends to be kind of a crowd and the ball would kind of be kicked around amongst three or four players. And I would just fly in and just knock them all over and take the ball. <laughs> and there was no foul because apparently goalies can get away with that. Yeah. The, uh, goalies are protected, really. Yeah. So I uh, like that aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I knew that. And so I think eventually I did like being keeper because I, I don't remember disliking it later on. Yeah. Majority of the time you were on the front line, you know, on offense. Right. If we got into a tight situation or we needed somebody to sub, I'd try to put you back there. Well, I think eventually I was always one half center forward, one half goalie. Mm. I think that was what eventually happened. Is that? I, I remember, I remember playing goalie every game. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And being bored sometimes and <laughs> terrified other times. <laughs> like the final championship game, do you remember? And it came down to a shootout. Yes. And uh, it was it was the final shootout before going to another round of shootouts. Yeah. And if I blocked it, we'd go to another round. But if it went in, then the game was over. And I, I, I predicted correctly where he was going to kick it. And I dove and got my fingers on it. But... As I'm laying in the mud, because it was, you know, November or December or something, and I'm in the mud, and, like water is soaking into my jersey, which was probably already waterlogged to begin with. The ball is, you can see it, you know, I got my hands on it, but not enough. And it just barely starts to roll and it rolls over the line and we lost the game. And we were all crying. I remember like Greg Olson and like everyone was, it was, it was a really intense championship game. And I just remember laying there and not knowing if I ever wanted to get up off the ground. It mm. just felt so bad, you know? It's like I was so close, but only if I had jumped further or something. And I remember you came up and said something like, get up off the ground. It's okay. You lost. Stop making a scene. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember thinking, yeah, that's probably, that's probably right. I should, you know, it, it's one thing to lose. It's another thing to make it all about me or something, you know, I just felt like I was in my yeah. head making it all about me when no one else really thought of it as completely my fault, you know, no one, right. no one blamed me or anything. Hopefully I didn't say that. Well, uh, it, it was, that we lost, <laughs> but it was something along those lines. It was something like, get up, you're okay. Or something, you know, like it, it was, I could a, see something like that. Yeah. But, um, cause I was just laying there for a long time. Yeah. And there's a fair amount of chaos because, you know, the, the winning team is celebrating and yes. jumping up and down and screaming and the parents and everything. And and all of us, you know, that had lost were just, uh, like I said, crying or just looking down at the ground, not knowing what to do. And uh, do you remember that moment? Um, I don't remember that particular moment. It was that, that year when we did really well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then we got bumped up to a harder league, and then we we started losing a lot. <laughs> well, we found out that, obviously, you want more competition to improve, right? Yeah. I, I would hope that I didn't put as much emphasis on winning. No. Um, no, I don't, you never said anything. The thing that people should know out there is my dad would come to every game, rain, snow, sleet, wind, uh, not only every game, but you also came to every practice. Eventually you were the coach of some of the teams, right? Basketball and soccer. And my friends would marvel at the level of dedication that you had. And I guess also my family, but my friend's parents weren't necessarily at every game. They certainly weren't at, you would come to practice and just hang out on, you would come from work, I think, and just mm. hang out. Yeah. You, you filmed every, every game yeah. and every wrestling match back when you might have been one of the only parents to even have a video camera back then. That's true. You would lug this 
heavy camera that came with a VCR slung from your shoulder that housed the VHS tape, you know, and you would stand with that 20 pound dead weight around your shoulder while and film again in the rain, in the snow. Also, after we would talk about how I could improve or what I did well or how I could improve my fundamentals, how to look at things, you know, it was a a lot of conversations. And at no point did I ever get a message from you that losing was a bad thing. It it was always framed as, do you think that you put all that you could into into your performance, even if you screwed up, even if you made mistakes, even if you lost, even if your particular performance was bad, do you feel like you put your all into it? And that that's what it was always about. Do you remember telling me that? I do. That's good because that's what I would say today. I do remember one time on defense when you're playing football, you're playing linebacker. And often, sometimes the other team would have a, a scat back that was quick and could juke. Mm-hmm. And which happens, you know, you're out on your own and, and trying to track this guy down. Yeah. There was this one kid from a team in Renton, I believe, that could yeah. just run circles around us. Yeah, he, re- he and, was and quick. He, he had like eight 60 to 70 yard touchdown runs. Yeah, he was he quick. Would just, he, he would come around the edge and yeah. he'd make one or two moves on a, on a linebacker and a cornerback and then he was just gone. Right. <laughs> and I was just, what are we supposed to do against this guy? Yeah. Well, I, I, I remember you come out, out on the edge and the guy would juke and, and get by you and I thought, um, okay, and I remember telling you that if a guy jukes you like that and you, you're trying to contain him uh, on the edge, there's nothing wrong. Go ahead and, and just fly at the guy. Reach out and, and because he's juking and, you know, I mean, you're not going to try to get an a- Yeah, you're not going to catch him from behind. Yeah. And this is your only shot. Right. And if he jukes you, just go ahead and, and, and reach out. Sometimes you'll grab the jersey or something just to slow him down. And the, the next game... <laughs> You you did that, and I said, "Wow, how can you tell a person one time, and it, and it, it sinks in that this is what you do?" And I thought that that was truly amazing. Because I have so much power as a father. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I have it, influence it, 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 over my yeah. It showed offspring. me that, that you really listened, and and um, I was really impressed. I said, "Wow, yeah, give it a shot." You know, I mean, the guy's going to get around you. You hope that defensive backs are coming up, got your back there. But if they don't, at least you gave it a shot, mm-hmm. you, you know. Well, another obvious function or benefit of sports in a family is that it had a lot of opportunity that you took advantage of to interact with us and me. Because <laughs> to, to think about that feedback loop of you're watching – and paying attention and caring. You know, I'm just thinking about myself. Like the first time this happened was one of Kevin, my little brother, had a wrestling match and you couldn't make it. So you you wanted me to film it. And so I went to the school and filmed it myself. And when I watched the film back, I noticed that the whole time Kevin was wrestling, I'm freaking out. I'm like, get, 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 no, no, but get, get get some leverage. Get, get, no, grab his grab his wrist. Okay, I'm I'm freaking out as I you know I I I, I want to get into his head and help him. There's this desire that you just have for someone that you care about that you want them to win. You feel connected to them, like you you are them in a certain way. And when you were watching me, I assume that it had something to do with that. You know, you're watching and you you don't want me to fail for my sake. You know, you don't want me to feel bad about myself. You care, I assume, also kind of about the team. And maybe you're thinking bigger picture of, well, if you get good at these skills, then next year you're good at those skills. So then you would talk with me after the game and you might tell me to do something like that, like you're saying. And then I do it and then you're you get a gratification on some level of like oh we're in a relationship t- together he he listens to me that makes me feel good or like a warm feeling or i don't know is is that the case yeah it's one thing to listen to suggestions to improve but it's another thing to deploy it you know it, it's like wow but did you feel warmth regarding the fact that you 
had some acknowledgement that I was paying attention and, and oh, respected yes. your opinion or something? Yes. Yeah. If if it never happened, I would just say maybe just repeat it. And but it was just the one time. I yeah. told you. And the next game, you did it, and I'm going like, wow. I mean, it was like you know that to a coach that's like, wow. Um, he really listened. Yeah. And he he's he's doing it. I mean, I don't know how many coaches would say they would have to go over and over and over on technique or, you know, how they want to the team to grow. grow. And um, not only as a team, but individually as well. Because if you improve individually, you're helping overall the team, right? Mm -hmm. And so these kinds of lessons are, it happens in real life as well. Mm -hmm. What was the end goal? Like, because... With sports, the message you instilled in me, which is true, that every skill or every conditioning uh, threshold you cross is in service to the next thing, the next season or the next sport or something. But what was the end goal? Aside from learning life lessons, like we talked about, was there another end goal that you were hoping that we would have as kids? We would achieve as kids yeah i wanted each one of you to experience sports and if you liked it um, fine uh, fortunately each time i introduced provided the opportunity for you to join different sports all of you were embraced it and you you made friends each one of you found your your sport that you could feel like this is what you wanted to do and that was my goal because in sports, in the sports that you played, especially growing up, you may not have the same teammates in high school. Some of them went to another school, but you knew them. You, you had friends for life, really. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that, the benefits of it, contacts and acquaintances and mm -hmm. friends, actually, you know, lifetime friends, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still friends with, you know, I mean, you know the guys that I'm still friends with. Yeah. So, did you have that? Mm, certainly in, in high school when I played football and wrestled. Yeah, they were friends that we maintained, you know, Christmas cards and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, getting back to your early childhood, what was it like growing up in, in your family? You're the younger, overshadowed brother from Gary, but you're also the older sibling of your three younger siblings. Yeah, I guess I was, like you said, uh, you've brought out before about um, families. Sometimes there's a clown or the funny one. And I think I was uh, that person. Mm. I could make my dad, my mom, brothers and sisters laugh. And it's kind of like, even to this day, we're, we're quite close. Mm-hmm. We do things together. My brother and my two sisters, and we text each other often. Oh, really? Yeah. And just to stay in contact. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that that would make my father and mother happy. Mm -hmm. You know, that we would remain close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was always the contrast between your family and mom's family that I noticed when I was really young that you're very close with your siblings and your parents, whereas mom is not so much. Yeah, mom, because there was quite an age gap between the three older ones, and then Sue came along. Well, there's also mom a lot of along. A resentment of things. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was spoken or otherwise. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about that growing up, but I remember associating it with Japanese versus white people. I remember thinking, well, Japanese people, because it wasn't just your siblings. It was all the aunts and uncles and the grandparents and the cousins. They were all the same in this way, dedicated to family, always showing up to things, no uncomfortable moments, really. And then the white side of the family. And I noticed my white friends that I grew up with often had this as well. Not all of them, but many of them did where, you know, I had friends that had cousins that might live nearby and they barely ever see them. And I thought, oh, it's so strange because my cousins that at least the ones that I can see frequently, I see them all the time uh, as a kid. So was it a Japanese thing or is it just our, our family thing? Mm, uh, it, I think it was overall the 
the Japanese American community in Spokane was, I, I believe, was that way. Mm -hmm. But certainly in our household, my mom and my dad didn't so much say it in words. They did it by mm, mostly action. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, gonna ha I'm happy that it influenced me this way, that I've continued it. Yeah, I think how that can look like is that when, for example, for me, in my, my memory, like if Auntie Tony were to graduate from nursing school back in the 80s mm -hmm. yeah. or 90s or whenever that was, and of, of course we're going to be there. And there was no question, there was no complaining. At no point were you like, oh, I really was looking forward to going on that golf trip. But <laughs> okay, I guess we'll go to Auntie Tony's graduation in Spokane. There was no uh, talk about why couldn't they pick a better weekend? You know, there, there's there, there's none of that talk where other families will have that kind of talk. And I think that communicates something very strong that is very much the case for me and my siblings, my three siblings, that there's never a question. I notice with other people close to me that there's always a question mark. If, if someone's getting married or there's a funeral or a birthday party or they invite you to something, there's always like, do I want to do this? Is this convenient for me right now? And, and certainly in, in our family, if something came up, then it, we wouldn't feel obligated to forego that other obligation. But I just noticed that with my siblings and with you and mom and others in our family, cousins and aunts and uncles, that there's, it's just, well, of course, and it's going to be a good time. And as long as there's not any major barrier to this, then there's really just no question because that's, that is what life is, is family and getting together and not even necessarily consciously thinking about it. It, it just goes straight from invitation to plans to go. There's, there's not a question mark there. Do you, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Our family is blessed that way. We're able to maintain contact. It takes work. Mm -hmm. You often initiate things with dad jokes or, or whatever. <laughs> but I, I want to highlight, Dad, that you are the architect of that value in us and the grandkids. It didn't just spring out of nowhere, particularly because when you moved away from Spokane to the Seattle area, we didn't have very much contact with your parents and all the extended family in Spokane. There was just you and Auntie Carol out here. And so you had to carry that torch and to model that. And whenever you had a, a vacation from Boeing, you would get, I think, two weeks a year, I believe. You would take it around Christmas and we would, we would always spend our vacation with family. That, that was what we did. There was, there was no question about that. At no point were you just like, ah, with this vacation, I'd rather go to the coast or I'd rather go on a golfing trip by myself. It, it was always just, of course, that that's what we do with family. And I always looked forward to it. You know, those, those are some of my favorite memories. You know, I, I, I never complained about it. Um, I, I wanted to do it. And, you know, I liked mom's side of the family as well, going out to the lake. Anyway, so, um, can you acknowledge that you were the architect of that? Um, I've never thought of myself that way, but I guess so. Another thing I remember getting back to the family value thing or valuing family is you would explicitly say that to me in my childhood and teen years. I remember there'd be times where there'd be some sort of, let's call it a guidance moment of some sort where you're trying to guide me. I'm yeah. trying to think of a context where it would be. Maybe it, maybe it was even something like I had a, a, a friend thing that was coming up and it conflicted with a family thing. And you were saying that I should go to the family thing. And I was like, but I want to go to this friend thing. I don't know if this is what it was, but you know, maybe something like this. And I remember you saying, look, friends are great, but at the end of the day, family is the most important thing. You know, it, Or maybe you were giving me these kind of speeches when... I was distant as a teenager mm. and always in my room. You were trying to say, look, uh, uh, whatever you have going on priority wise, you have to understand that family is the most important thing. Do you remember saying those things to me? Mm, it wasn't quite often, um, but maybe I could see that when you were preteen or 
teenager just and those things happen where you're you're obviously taller than me now <laughs> so you're making your your own decisions which which are good but i have to sometimes as a parent let you know what this value is what we're going to do this is this is how i feel and this is this is how i want you to embrace mm-hmm. and and this is the reason why i don't want to say you know I, i've said this before to you is friends come and go but family is always there mm-hmm. so me for me you make your investment that way certainly you will want to have your friends and you have a great fan fan base who are in deserved listeners but for me the number one priority is family mm-hmm. yeah yeah when was the time when you were the most worried about me as a kid or a teenager mm. I remember you must have been like 11, 10, 11. Um, hmm. You were sandwiched in between two older siblings and a younger sibling. Yeah. And Right. So to set the stage, I, Mark and Colleen, my older siblings, were extroverted and highly active yes. in high school. Yes. Uh, you know, football team, cheerleading team, popular yeah. at school and at church and the youth group. Yeah. Large group of friends. Yeah. I'm 10 or 11. That's not the most non-awkward time in a child's life. And then my little brother is is cute and he's like five or six <laughs> years old. He's also very loud and active and everyone loves him. Yeah. And he's the baby of the family. And I'm often in my own world anyway. Right. Yeah. Even when I was three and four years old, that was correct that claim. So why were you worried about me? I remember our conversation between uh, your mother and I, and we both felt that you were because the family you know, we were involved, of course, with the older ones because they were they had their own activities, and Ke- Kevin was requiring a lot of our attention because he was younger. And you were just fine just going downstairs. And I said, no. <laughs> I told your mother and I, we had this conversation where we said, he's, he's just fine, just the attention going above him and below him. And he's just going to go into his own little world here. And I says, you know what? We need to draw him back in. Uh, we're not going to say... Know, I didn't know I was that young when this happened. I, I remember you and mom going on a campaign to draw me out of my room when I was older. Yeah. But I didn't know I was that young. Well, you were just fine being you and your own thoughts and you, you're doing well in school. So there was no concern. All of you kids did well in school, took a whole lot of pressure off mom and dad (laughs) uh, because all of our kids did well. And, um, yeah, you guys never had to, do anything about my academics we never had to say have you studied for uh, yeah i would show you the report cards that's that's it and you'd go like huh and then you'd put it up on the fridge or something and that was it that was that's as that's as much conversation that we ever had about schooling well uh fortunately for us um all of you kids were doing well in school we never had to put any um uh, carrots out there. If mm-hmm. you get an A on this, I mean, you, you're you already getting A's. And so, so when I was 10 or 11, is that when you went on the campaign to, cause I remember you and mom would come down into my room and yeah, try to uh, interact with me. Just talk. Yeah. I, I also remember you would, well, okay. So I do remember it when I was younger. So you, you got the VCR and the video camera mm-hmm. in 1982 ish. 83 yeah before almost anyone else i didn't know anyone else who had a vcr aside from us and i you know i knew dozens if not hundreds of kids in my neighborhood and and you had it first it wasn't long before a lot of other people had at least vcrs yeah there was that tiny little vhs rental store in issaquah it was the only one yes and they had like 15 options (laughs) I, it, it, it was this tiny little closet of a store. Yeah. I remember that you would rent a movie. Mm-hmm. And I guess 
no one else was interested in like maybe Mark and Colleen were out doing something and Kevin was already in bed and you would actually come downstairs and say, Hey Kirk, come watch this movie with me. Do you remember doing that? Uh, I can remember. Um, yeah. You know, they were out and about, but was that part of the mission to draw me out of my room? Hmm. Cause I feel like it was cause it, it, it did basically do that. I remember it was a bit of a, a chore at first, I was like, oh, I was doing something. But then <laughs> once we were watching a movie, I remember thinking, oh, this is okay. Like, yeah. we saw Terminator. I didn't I didn't know about the movie Terminator. I uh-huh. didn't really even know Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay. You know, this was before all that stuff. And I remember you had rented Terminator probably because it was just one of the VHS tapes that was on the shelf. And I remember watching it and thinking like, oh, my God, thank God that Dad asked me to come upstairs and watch this movie with me. It's amazing, this this movie, The Terminator. Because, uh, you know, we didn't have cable uh, no. yet. And, and yeah. so we were in the dark about a lot of those things. And, and so there was a, yeah, that's interesting. So, so you were worried that what? I would become like a hermit in life or something? No, not worried. We just wanted to make sure you were, you knew that we were there mm-hmm. and that we were, uh, obviously cared and loved you, and um, that we know that you are happy just being downstairs. But we wanted to let you know that we were there. So you worried that I was isolating because I had given up on the family, that I concluded that no one cared to notice me or something? No, I, I think it was um, that you were introspective at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and that you were happy just doing drawings down there or playing your Dungeons and Dragons, that kind of thing. And yeah. and we were okay with that, what you were interested in. Yeah. But we wanted you to know that mom and dad were there. Yeah. If you need us, we're there. Yeah. Well, mom was worried about Dungeons and Dragons. She had heard it was a satanic Yes, I, I remember that. Did, were you worried? Um, I, I guess I was just... Because mom had raised a red flag, it it didn't. The cover of the game and stuff, you know, I just thought, well, it's nice graphics and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't blame mom or anyone else for having a question mark because, yeah, the, the cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide is literally a devil that is killing these adventurers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think has a scantily clad warrior woman in his grasp and you know, horns and red skin and <laughs> flames. And if you're a responsible parent, particularly, I guess, if you're Christian, you're going to look at that and think, what's going on here? Because it's not a game made for kids. It's a game made for adults. And suddenly at the time, there were all these kids that were playing it. And I can attest to the fact that none of us were <laughs> being influenced by anything bad. It was, it's, just a, it's just a game that I think everyone understands now. But anyway, so... Was there another time you were worried, like later on when I was in high school or college? or? I guess it was that, that last quarter <laughs> of your high school. Yeah. So to set the stage on this, I was so monumentally bored by high school. And the beginning of my junior year, I had heard about what it took to get into the University of Washington, which is where I wanted to go. And it's not easy to get in, but I had figured out mathematically, given my test scores and my grades, that I could fail all the rest of my classes and still have a wide margin between my index, because that's the way they did it back then. You, they just, uh, uh, you looked at your grades and you looked at your test scores and you got an index number. And I looked at the chart and figured out mathematically what my grade point average would be if I flunked all the rest of my classes and I was still way above the, the threshold. And so I thought, it's illogical for me to try in school because I'm not learning anything really. And I could still learn, but I'm just not going to try to you know, get a good grade. It's, I'm actually doing a disservice to my life by putting effort into something that means nothing. You know, I'll miss out on socializing or uh, daydreaming in class or whatever. And so I figured out that I needed to pass a certain amount of classes, but I didn't need to do well in them. So I, but I could also flunk some of the classes and still graduate. And I, you know, I had asked around to see if the university would 
take exception to someone that had tanked their grades later on. And they said, no, it's a very dispassionate process of grades and test scores. That's, they just look at your index number and they let you in. They, they, don't look any, they don't look any further into it. I'm like, okay. So I set out to do that, but I don't tell anyone about it because I've never informed my parents about anything along these lines. And you start getting these pink slips. I also start skipping school more often because I'm, I'm thinking, I, why do I even need to be here? You know, And so you start getting these pink slips saying that I've been skipping school. You start getting my grade reports and I'm getting like D's and F's. And I remember I was watching TV just laying there on the living room floor and you come in and you're just like, what? Because it, it was addressed to you, right? Do you remember this moment? I can't recall all the details, but I, I do remember obviously... We were cons- mom and I were concerned. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you come up to me, and you're standing up around like the stairwell, and I'm laying on the ground in the living room. You're about I don't know ten feet away, and and you just I've never seen you a- as angry as you were here. And it wasn't even really that angry, but I I'd, I'd never seen you unglued. And since I've never seen you were unglued. You were like, what is happening? Because it was this it wasn't just my grades had slipped because i was straight a student you would you guys would comment about an a minus you'd be like what's going on with this a minus you know and so I, i'm getting d's and f's across the board and, and, and you oddly enough i was getting an a in calculus because i just i don't know I, I just liked it i guess but but the rest of them and you're you're really angry and, and you know given my teenage narcissism i didn't actually do what I should have done, which is I, I should have actually explained it to you or at least validated your concerns and said, you know, I, I have a I have a similar concern. I don't want to fail academically, you know, I, I'm not but I, I, I just blew you off. I was like, Dad, I got it all figured out, leave me alone or something like that. <laughs> I don't know, something along those lines. And that yeah, of course that just escalated the situation and you're even more angry and you're just like, This will not but I was I had established the facts on the ground such that no matter how angry you got and no matter how many points you brought up, I was sure in my position. It turned out I was right in the end, but I don't know if I knew enough to know I would be right, but I I narcissistically had established that I was right. And so you being upset with me was more of a, of a just kind of notable, like, oh my God, I remember thinking, I've never seen dad so angry before, but there's nothing to be angry about. And I remember just not getting perturbed by you by, by you being angry because I just thought uh, uh, what do you what do you remember about this I can't recall that particular moment but I can under I believe that yeah I would have been quite upset yeah and understandably so to have a kid that is so close to the finish line yeah have evidence that he might not even graduate from high school because <laughs> that's the way it kind of looked yeah to see that must have been yeah, quite I, I thought, alarming. And, yeah. and to have me blow you off without, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have an excuse. I wasn't like, oh, I'll, I'll get my grades up, Dad. I, I just I just said, don't worry about it. I have it all figured out. Yeah, it was kind of like that. It wasn't um, settling me down or answering uh, <laughs> my, my um, concerns. I mean, I did explain to you the index thing. Yes. But you were skeptical of that claim. Yeah, you what, thought what, what that uh, what changed uni- our mind yeah. was uh, one of my best friends, um, golf friends, and just friends, Japanese American guy. Yes, he he's at that time a high school principal, Ed, right? In, yeah. What's in, his last name? In Seattle, Yakshujin. Yeah, yeah. And I explained to him about you and what was going on, and and uh, we got these letters and and. Uh, basically what I was saying is like uh, get a load Kirk, of my son <laughs> Kirk is saying that this last semester doesn't count toward anything he just looked at me and he started laughing he says yeah he's right and I says what <laughs> you mean he can still get in the cl-? he says yeah the UW well that's they look at just the first part of they don't look at this last part and I says, well, why do we even bother going to school then? That's what I thought. <laughs> and if it's already made up, and he he just kind of calmed me down. He was kind of laughing. He says, yeah, he's he's right. So I went home and had conversation with Sue, 
who knew Ed as well. And he said, I said, he's right. So it took, a obviously, a load off our shoulders. We yeah. were concerned for your yeah. your future. And, and like, wh- wh- what has changed here? You know, you're always on honor roll, and all of a sudden, what? Yeah. We're almost to the finish line here, and we're going to get going to, to school. I recall you going with your good friend to some college recruiters came to Issaquah High School, or you went to a function where uh, college recruiters were available for you to talk to. Uh, one of your best friends decided he was going to Brown University mm-hmm. and um, quite a good student. And he talked to you and said, well, where are you going? And you obviously had a conversation that you thought you would go to the U, and he thought you had more potential going to an Ivy League going back east, going to an Ivy League school. And you ended up talking and getting accepted to Cornell University. I, me? Yeah. Did, Did I apply? Well, you you had come, and it was like like... Yeah, they looked at your transcript or something. and I don't remember this at all. And I, I said, well, okay. Because obviously, like all of you kids, were gifted that you were good students, just good students. And um, you must have been pleasure for teachers to have you in your class because you always excelled. And I want to make it clear to your audience that it was not pushed by us. We let you find your own level. And um, uh, not pushed, but I think there was an expectation that we would excel at our at, at whatever. Well, I guess I, I never found out because I didn't struggle. But I, I I'll take your word for it that let's say for whatever reason academically I just didn't have the the you know the aptitude that you would have been okay at me with me getting B's and C's. Yeah, but I I was under the impression that I was expected to do well. I guess based on my previous track record that since I had already done well, that I, I was expected to continue with that. Well, <clears throat> not that I would have been punished, but I, I remember that there was a there was a message about make sure you keep your grades up kind of a thing. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't, hopefully it wasn't something that weighed heavily on you. No. We, we both were, like mom and I, we were just pleased that all of you kids were doing well. Yeah. It wasn't something like maybe it was felt. I don't know. Um, but we never. Because I had friends that would get paid if they got mm. like a B. Mm-hmm. They, they would get paid like a $20 bill if mm-hmm. they got a B. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I think the threshold of acceptability with my parents is, is a lot higher. Because um, I think the default is an A, you know, like that's, that's, of course you're going to get an A, Kirk, because that's just what's going to happen. Um, I got B's occasionally, and I don't remember ever it being a problem, but it just, it was a, yeah, it was just kind of a felt sense, you know, maybe because my siblings also did well or, yeah, I don't know, and I had done well in the past, but, but uh, anyway, what were we talking about? You came home and told me after that, that Cornell was kind of like in the, in the mix now, and along with the UW. So I said, oh, okay. And so I did some research on it, and I thought, well, you know, that the university would help you because it was quite expensive. Cornell. Yeah. Yeah. And then living expense and that kind of thing. So I said, well, we'll do whatever we can to make this happen if that's what you want. And then <laughs> and then about a week or two after that, you, you just came to me and you said, Dad? I says, yeah. Uh, he says, I, I just want to go to the U. Is that okay? And I said, <laughs> well, yeah, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, is this something that uh, you can get the courses that you want? And he says, yeah. Were you yeah. celebrating on inside because you didn't have to pay for? Oh, my God. I thought, well, how are we going <laughs> to make this happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's a, especially back then, because yeah. the University of Washington was much more subsidized back then. So tuition was yeah. much lower yes. than it than it is now. But the difference between tuition <laughs> uh, but, and, and 
travel and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it would have been pretty. Yeah, I remember, have, I didn't, God, that's so weird, Dad, that I was thinking about Cornell. That That is, you sure it wasn't Ithaca? No, it was Cornell. It was Cornell. Because I and remember I said, mom, mom. mom fell in love with the, with the pamphlets that Ithaca would send me. Uh, I don't remember Cornell being in the mix at all. All I thought was I had applied to the University of Washington, but I do remember thinking that it was ridiculous to spend that much on tuition because I knew how much those private schools cost and what Ivy League schools cost. And I just thought that is a complete waste of money and I'm not going to waste my parents' money on such silliness because education is education and the University of Washington is one of the best universities in the world. People come from all over the world to go to it and have to pay out-of-state tuition prices, which sucks for them. Just because it's cheaper doesn't mean it's any lesser or anything. Correct. And it's 25 minutes drive <laughs> from home. Um, and my sister went there and uh, other family members went there. And, uh, you know, we would watch Husky games. And so yeah. it's like, why would I? Uh, I have friends that are going to UW. I don't know anyone going to Cornell. <laughs> so yeah. I, I remember thinking it was it was just an obvious choice. Uh, I don't know if I would have chosen something different if we lived further away from UW. I don't know. But, yeah. So, um, that's interesting. And, you know, kudos to you for giving me that option. And I do remember having that in my head that, well, if I decided to go to a private school, my parents would still pay for it. I don't remember that ever being a notion that I had received that somehow it would be a hardship. There was never any kind of... Um, question in my mind as to whether or not you would be able to afford it like you ne I, but just knowing your because eventually once i got my business degree at the university of washington i started doing your taxes and found out how much money you made you and mom and you guys were not rich people back then still aren't still aren't <laughs> but to think that you would have nonchalantly said kirk go wherever you want to go i i think is is quite a gift i suppose i mean the fact that you even managed to afford me living off living in a frat you know what i mean which isn't cheap it's it's on the cheaper side of things but it's not super cheap and you never complained you never said oh i don't know if we're going to be able to afford that or you never held it over my head or anything like that's quite a testament to your generosity to, for your kids really well basically mom and i we were just pleased that you all had a goal and we felt we needed to provide everything we could do to help you out in achieving that goal. Because all of you, real good students and good people, and still today, the same, just good people. Can you attribute that to your parenting? Um, I, I could see in tandem for mom and I. And um, yes, it wasn't uh, something we set out to do but it was something i guess that um we didn't talk about that can you pat yourself on the back um figuratively for having raised four kids that are happy and love each other and yeah, that, like like <laughs> to hang out together yes that that is such a blessing for and, and have kids that are thriving and yes um can, so can you pat yourself on the back for that <laughs> well um, uh, yes, I think it's, um, to me, I, I know it's a partnership for mom and I, how it's received, uh, for you kids, but I, 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 I pay much more kudos to mom and how no matter what she was going to step up. And I knew that together we could do it, you know, whatever it may be to provide for you, like, you know. Your trip to Washington, D.C. when you were, what, a sophomore? Or? I think a junior. Yeah, and we heard about it, and we thought, wow, this I think this is something. Yeah, it was a school-organized trip. Yeah, we yeah. wanted you to ex be exposed to, well, first of all, to see the Capitol. And then you made some, some good friends back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a lot of memories from that trip. Yeah, but I remember hearing about it and then telling you about it, and you thought, huh? This isn't something that was on my... Yeah, uh, that's even. funny. I forgot about that, but I do remember it now that I didn't ask you right. to do it. I had heard about it as well. Yeah. I, I had good friends, you know, Baker and Pinkley and all those guys were going. Uh, Artie, for example. 
And I think at the time I thought, well, that's expensive and unnecessary. So why? But then later you came to me and you're like, hey, that Washington DC trip, uh, you should go. Uh, Huh? Not a lot of parents will volunteer that (laughs) for their kids where, because, you know, usually you're in the practice as a parent of having the kid come to you and then you say yes or no. It's not usually that the parents are looking for things to spend more money on for the kids independent of the child coming to you and saying, uh, uh, can can you pay for this? So, yeah, I remember you doing that and thinking that – because I think I remember my friends saying it was the opposite where they would bring it to their parents and their parents would hem and haw and – it was never the case with you and mom. It was always, I, I never had this feeling. And, and maybe that's why once I became older and was making decisions about where to go to college that I felt so, I guess, fulfilled with generosity from you and mom that I was protective of, of you, regard, you know, even though you never gave the impression that we needed to protect you. It, I had already been given enough that I felt like I didn't need any more. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't feel deprived in, in mm-hmm. that way. And when it came time to think about going to different colleges, I, it was on my mind. I was like, I don't want to waste my parents' money in that way. They, you know, they can, there's so many other things they can do with that money. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it, there's something else that would be more useful w- with that money. And so I should choose a very good university, the University of Washington, be, you know, at least partially because of the, the perc- I mean, I'm guessing tuition wise, it's like 10% what, uh, what a private school would have cost. I and mean, we're not talking like a 50% savings. It was drastically less mm-hmm. anyway. So yeah, that's notable that I, and I remember noting that I thought, wow, my parents are different from other parents that they would come to me and say, Hey, you should go on this very expensive trip to Washington, D.C., wouldn't that be fun? And I remember thinking, yeah, I guess that would be fun. Yes. Um, We just thought it was an opportunity for you uh, because you had kind of impressed us that, you know, you had leadership qualities. and and, How did uh, you know that? um, We could tell from what you were involved in at school. You are doing, you got involved in your sports. You did skits with your classmates. (laughs) And then... At a talent show, before this talent show, you came up to me and, and told me, uh, "Dad," I says, "Yeah." He says, uh, "I'm a, I think I'm gonna sing in the in the talent contest." I says, "Oh, good." And Mom and I, we had never heard you sing. Uh, when we were in church, I could see you uh, mouthing the words, or because you played um, your cornet. So you knew your notes and timing and all that. But we, both mom and I, we had never heard you sing. And when you sang the duet with um, Sarah, Sarah, uh, we were, and, and your sister and brother, Mark and Colleen and Kirk and Kevin, um, we were all just kind of blown away because we'd never heard, I says, I couldn't imagine, for one, getting up and and uh, singing. No, I, so, I, well, yeah, I was utterly terrified. I've talked you, about the podcast before. I was, I was a hair width away from just running out the back door of the stage and never coming back. You you handle it well. It came off so 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 great. Um, so that's funny because yeah, we sang in church every Sunday. Yeah, like multiple songs, and the six of us as a family would stand mm-hmm. and next to each other and sing. And Mark was a singer, so I guess you could probably. And he's tall and bigger, so you would hear him. And then Colleen, I guess you could mm-hmm. probably hear her. And then Mom likes to sing and feel like you like to sing as well, right? <laughs> I I dabbled at it, yeah, yeah, but I didn't know that I would be the sort of overshadowed uh, the shorter one that can't really be heard or something because I do remember singing and paying attention to the notes as you say because I played trumpet and learned you know the different notes and whatnot and liked to entertain myself by following the contour and also I would entertain myself by listening to people harmonize it sounded great and I remember 
really studying that and I would pay attention to it because I was so bored, you know, in, in church. <laughs> the sermons were so long and I just wanted to go home and watch cartoons and and I remember I tried to entertain myself that, however I could and I, I remember music was a big part of that. And so I didn't know that I was being quiet though that, and, and I didn't know that you didn't know that, that I could sing and I didn't know I could sing really. You know, Sarah <laughs> being the singer that she was would hear me singing in the car with her or something to top 40 and she would say that I could sing and I thought huh and I remember I sang falsetto I didn't I didn't know what falsetto was that's when you sing really high and she says oh you have good falsetto technique and I was I was like what is that I didn't even know what she was talking about (laughs) and so that talent show my sophomore year after Sarah coerced me (laughs) slightly to sing a duet with her at the talent show, I had unleashed in me a, a desire, a, a drive for music that had never really been there before. And at that talent show, I got other musicians who were playing in the talent show, like Huber and Hino and the other guys, and said, let's start a band together. And so we started a band and I started writing music and I became totally obsessed. I was spending a lot of time in my bedroom anyway, but now I was spending all my time in my bedroom writing music, listening to music, recording music, figuring out music, cobbling together different instruments. There was a a, a guitar that we had laying around the house. Was it Uncle Ron's old guitar or something? It had one string on it. Do do you know where that guitar came from? Um, I'm going to say it was something that I had brought from Spokane. Right. I remember I, it, was, think, it seemed like it was really old. Yes. I'm going to say that I got it from my dad's sister, who was, her husband was a farmer. They were farmers. Your dad's sister? Tycho. Tycho. You think it was from Uncle Itch? One of his workers. It and obviously if it only Itch. had a couple of strings on it. One. It had one string. <laughs> was Uncle Itch's worker Japanese? or yeah. Okay. Yeah. So somehow it gets into Uncle Itch's hands, which gets into Tycho's hands, which gets into your hands, which yeah. gets into my hands. Yeah, I remember having you tell me whose it was, and I thought it was this ancient musical instrument from the old days. Ah. And it had one string, and I tried to and would write music on that one-stringed guitar. Ah. Anyway, so you're observing all this, and... I'm spending even more time isolating in my room. (laughs) And my grades started to go down, not because of music, but because I was making this choice. And I remember that you weren't happy that I was spending so much time in music because you thought that I was... I don't know if this is exactly how it went, but I think you attributed my slacking in school to the amount of time that I was spending on music. Do you remember this? Mm, Maybe. Um... Well, what what do you remember about your feeling about me getting into music? Um, when I really get started this, again, too. and this may I don't know. I'll just throw this out there: is like my memories of that was I believe you were in your freshman year at the UW, and you told me that you were really interested in music, and you were thinking of making that music would be your career. Yeah, yeah, uh, your major. And I said, okay, that's good. But I said, my recommendation is treat it like a, a minor mm-hmm. and get your four-year you know, degree in your hip pocket. And then if music is mm-hmm. something you want to continue, that's fine. But you've got, this, you've got this degree that you can fall back on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember many conversations in that category, including those conversations. And just like the time when I lunged at that runner on the edge as he was juking me, I listened and and followed that advice. Yeah, I definitely remember lots of conversations, lots of guidance about, and this, you know, goes back to something that I emphasized in my work with people, whether it's parents or teens, and also just on the podcast when I talk about different needs that kids have. You know, we understand there are certain needs that all kids have, like for love and nurturance and for nourishment and safety and another thing that i think is very important is guidance is that you have essentially mentorship or attuned parents who are good at 
imparting wisdom and knowledge in a way that can be accepted by the kids. It depends on the relationship, but it's something that I think isn't talked about enough that uh, we you know don't emphasize that. And certainly a lot of parents do, but I think we tend to, in America, value giving kids freedom to choose for themselves, which of course is important, but there's a balance between freedom and also offering things up for digestion within the mind of the child, such as you could always get a degree that is in your back pocket that you could use, and maybe you'll use it in music, but you don't really know what the future holds. You don't really know where you're headed. And now that you're here in college, you know, you might as well just power through a a pretty solid degree like in business and you'd be able to use it. And that totally actually ended up happening for me because when I decided to become a therapist, they on the application just said, you just need a bachelor's degree. It doesn't even need, need to be in psychology. And I was like, thank God I have a bachelor's degree because, and then when I went into private practice and then when I started a podcast, having a degree in business, having that foundation of accounting and finance and marketing and business writing and business planning and all the things that I learned early on uh, was a foundation for me to be able to make sure that I'm keeping track of things and paying my taxes and having a business plan and getting a business license. You know, I've coached and mentored a lot of novice therapists who are in this position. It's, It's not an automatic aptitude or skill to be able to keep track of business and to plan business wise and to budget things and to understand marketing and to understand the importance of knowing your customers, that kind of thing. And, and so, yeah, yeah. So it's not just with that piece of advice, but there, there were a lot of things that, that you advised upon. And I don't think I ever really thought about it, but do you think that you gave more advice along those lines than mom did? Uh, probably so. Yeah. I don't think I thought about that till just now that, cause I would have thought, well, yeah, my parents both. But when I think about it, it was, it was you that mainly, was having those conversations about what to do, how, how to make the right moves in life. Yeah, I, I think you're correct. Um, not to say that mom wasn't supportive because she was. Yeah. And she just wanted the best and still does. I was probably more pragmatic about it because some things I've been there, you know, and done that. And, and well, I you can... also had a long-term career by that point. Yeah, I could see what, knowing my children, you try to help them as to find their own level where they want to go for education and for their life. Mm-hmm. You know, I know those are things that they're important. Um, well, first off, I just want to observe that I'm glad that you're able to pat yourself on the back regarding your parenting because mom can't, I think, because of the way she was treated growing up. You listened to those episodes where I interviewed mom, right? Yeah, you know, they... <laughs> It, it's, um, it's sad that she can't because she's um, <laughs> she's always been supportive of everything that you've done, going to all the the soccer games and football games. But also games. just in terms of parenting, love and attention, yes. both you and, and mom are loving and there and safe. You and mom never fought, really. <laughs> there was no yelling. There was no name calling. You guys didn't drink, <laughs> you know. There was no chaos. It was just dad comes home at five fifteen every day, which tells you about traffic back then. That it only would take you fifteen minutes, right, to get from Renton to Issaquah or Sammamish now. And dinner was on the table, and all six of, us, six of us sit around the table, and we go to church on Sunday morning, and you'd go golfing, maybe Sunday evening or or Saturday or something. And it was just this very loving stable, good environment, you know, and it takes effort. You know, there's so many little whys in the road, right? There are times when you want to yell. There are times when you'd rather just avoid it. There are times when you want to complain directly at your wife instead of doing it behind closed doors. There are times when you'd rather save your money and not pay for your kids, your snot-nosed ingrates of, of of a child being me to pay for him to go to college, you know? So, there's all these little decisions that, that you made. You know, I, I think about when I was three, four years old, there was this routine that we would kiss you goodnight. And I remember by, you know, eight o'clock, your beard was so scratchy. That's just all I remember was just how scratchy your face was. 
and just how much you know love and attention and you know you had friends but you didn't really spend much time away from home it, it was all about the kids for, for you and mom I, and so during the interview with mom on the podcast mom seemed to indicate that you felt similarly that you couldn't uh, take credit but it sounds like you can which is which is great well um hmm. i i don't know if it's credit yeah that's it's like you you try to make it as the situation as um open for you kids to succeed and that was that was um a lot of times our goal or my goal is to yeah you know but you also it's it, it, so the way you frame it it's like that you gave us opportunity but it's way more that's great of course but my belief system is that more fundamentally it's the attention and the love and the the warmth the feeling of that your parents love you and care about you i i remember when my friends were uh, going through divorces with their parents and hearing about how they would have to choose or that they might go to one parent's house primarily over the other. And I posed the question to myself, or it was posed to me by my friends, like, who would you decide to live with, mom or dad? And I remember really thinking about it. I distinctly remember thinking, okay. And I remember trying it on in my head because it was such a foreign idea of like, okay, if I lived with dad alone without mom, what would that be like? Okay, what would it be like with mom? And I could not decide. I could, I, there was no, it was right down the middle. I couldn't figure out. I was like, well, I, I don't know which one. I remember thinking that was interesting to me because I had friends who had very clear idea. Oh, I'd much rather live with my mom or I'd much rather live with my dad. Or, and I just didn't have that. And that says something. I think that, that, that says a lot. And you and mom didn't parent in the same ways. It's not like you were constantly a united front, you know. I knew if I wanted money, I would go to you. And I knew if I, um, what was mom? Mom was, was mom more likely to let me leave the house? I can't remember. There was something that I went to you for and something that I went, for, and I would never go to mom for money. Like it was just like, it, that just would never happen. But you were always just like, yep, yeah, here you go. <laughs> Here's a 20 or something. And it was, uh, but for mom, it was like she was very adamant about making sure that we understood the value of money. Um, and there was something else that you were always a know about that mom was. A, and anyway, point is, is that I'm glad that you can uh, take at least some credit. But I think you should take credit f for the things you do. But I think more importantly, you should take credit for the, the love that was in the family. Because mm. that's the most important thing. It is. Still is. Can you take credit for that? Um, I mean, you could say you got it from your parents, I suppose, but can, can you take credit for having inst having done those micro behaviors throughout our childhoods? You know, I, I guess if you pointed out that it's it's um, that it worked, then yes, you know, I can say that I had a part in that. Yeah, uh, it was important, obviously, and still is to both um, me and mom. Yeah, because I don't know about you, but mom was saying that. For the two of you, you, from the very beginning, when you're parking at the drive-in movie theater and making out in the back seat and having conversations about how many kids you want to have one day while you're in high school, and both of you are like, oh, I want a lot of kids. Oh, me too. And from that point, you were oriented towards children. You wanted to have children so that you could give them a good life. It wasn't... That's true. It um, was from the beginning. You're, you're, you're as you're making out in the back seat of that car. <laughs> it's, it, it's, that's, that's the mission. That's the goal. You would have that, and it showed in your parenting, your lifestyle growing up with us. You know, other families are like this too, but not every family is like this. Not every family has parents that are that dedicated, you know, mind, soul, and body to loving and also creating a structure around a family that is conducive to happiness and growth. I think you should take tremendous. In your later years, you should take tremendous pride and pleasure in knowing that your mission that you set out from an early age as a couple, that you nailed it. Well, we are um, obviously grateful to have uh, four great children and seven great grandchildren, and um, we feel blessed in a lot of ways. We know that we're together on that. 
uh, Sue and I. We're invested in, in your lives, and we never feel like our job is done. So you just had your 60th wedding anniversary. Yes. What advice do you have for the listeners regarding how to, how to have a successful marriage? Well, um, fortunately for me, I'm, I'm married to a, a lady who, who embraces that don't go to bed mad because the next day when we wake up, she is um, happy and... Um, how Does, do you how do you do that? What do you do to I don't, not go to bed mad? How do I do that? Uh, yeah. It's it's her. What does she do? She she lets go. She lets it go. Um, she lives that don't go to bed mad. You know, Let, just she lets it go in her head. Yes, I think so. What do yeah, you because, What do you do? Well, <laughs> I'm I'm fuming maybe. Oh, you know, she's better at it. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, and if she weren't like that, then you would have been at odds more often. Oh, yes, definitely. Oh. Um, she has a, a, um, a way of, of handling that uh, where it just goes, it goes away. Um, just recently, we've, we've had where we're discovering we need to talk things out. So we're still growing. You know, it's, it's not... Um, business as usual after 60 years it's still uh discovering who you are and where you're going Hmm. so yeah i I, you know for me been lucky to have a a partner who um although we've changed over the years you you just can't help it you change Uh, we don't have we don't have um our children and our our lives the way we did Mm -hmm. where we're driven by their activities we're back into it now a little bit because we're with grandkids uh, watching our eight and 10 year old getting involved in. So we're, we're back to where we were, Mm -hmm. you know, some, some 40 years ago. That's why I was suggesting you move up to Bellingham that one afternoon. I know. I know. I'm I'm like, you could, uh, it could be a win win because you'll be down the street from the grandkids and the grandkids will have you and Kevin and Katina will have, free babysitters all the time because you guys are (laughs) tired so uh, sell this house i know flooding all the time in the basement and and move up to Bellingham. it's been such a blessing for us to watch them grow up um even though you know we watch them a couple days a week um those four days that or five days that we don't see them the next time it's like we it's almost like we can see them growing taller yeah before our very eyes and so it's not, they obviously, like you said, they'll, they'll remember us for yeah. sure. Yeah. And uh, so they know, they know how I am and how Sue is, you know, during the day and how we interact. And they're smart kids. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Very smart. Yeah. And a lot of um, credit goes to Kevin and Katina. Mm-hmm. If there's one thing that you would tell people about how to have conversations to work out conflicts like you're learning right now, what would you tell people? Hmm. Uh, I would say think it through before you get some of us, like me, I need time to digest it and think it over. Hmm. Um, Because I want to think of, um, and I know it's impossible, every possible scenario. And uh, whereas mom is is, um, more... I've got the solution and let's do it. Mm. I'm more want to see it mm. first. Maybe that's good. We've always had checks and balances, that kind of thing. She's more, let's go do it. You know, just let's do it. And I'm more reserved in that way. So that's paid off sometimes. Sometimes it's like, yeah, should <laughs> should it didn't then. Mm. But it's just trial and error, mm-hmm. what works. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly she knows and I know. Basically, you can kind of tell what the reaction will be, given the subject, whatever it is that you're going to talk about, what, what kind of reaction you're going to get. And so, but you still have to listen hmm. because you can learn something. Still, hmm. we're still learning. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's more give and take. And that's, that's the thing is um, if one has that gift that Sue has, like don't go to bed mad, that has that made... A lot. Mm-hmm. When in the morning, 
So she's you're just, grateful that she gives you that gift? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, because I can relive it. Mm. And, and Sue is like, you know, that we're not going there mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So it's a constant growing. Yeah. You can, you can teach an old dog new tricks after <laughs> all. Well, what advice parenting would you give young parents today? Oh, be involved. Be involved um, in their lives. Um, understand when they're uh, having a difficulty, whether it's with learning or a friend. How, how do you figure that out, though? You know, you have a right 11-year-old quiet yeah. kid that's stuck in his room all the time. Yeah, you got to stay close to them, try to understand them. There were times uh, that I remember where I would step in when I felt like I needed to because mm -hmm. I felt like that was what my child needed. Like what? Um, well, it's like for you and, and for Colleen, your sister, there were neighborhood kids that were kind of bothering older kids, and I would go to the... I finally... Oh. I, yeah, I went to... Knocked on doors and yeah. said, this, this needs to stop. Yeah, uh, well, there was one time when a neighborhood bully who was four or five years older than me had bullied me severely on the way home. I walked home from school, just like every other kid, and he... Uh, for some reason, I was by myself, and he just targeted me for the first time. Like, it, it wasn't an ongoing thing. It was just like he just decided that I was going to be his victim that day. And he walked all the way home a mile of the trip, and he was hitting me the entire time. And I couldn't run from him, so I just had to slowly plot along while he walked near me and put me down and hit me and... and when we walked by the Sanders house, which was a teacher in mm -hmm. the school, he put his arm around me and acted like he was consoling me while I was crying. And we got home, or I got home, and I must have told somebody, and then you got home, from, and so mom hears this, then mom tells you when you get home from work that day, and you said, you know, put on your coat, we're going to their house. <laughs> and, and so, do you remember this? I don't remember you coming along. You knocked on the door, and I'm behind you, and the dad comes to the door, and you have a conversation in the doorway, and you, you tell him what's going on. And you weren't screaming or anything. You were just informing firmly. And the dad uh, wasn't surprised. And to my memory, as the door was closing, it sounded like the dad was going to go after the kid, the bully, physically or something, is what I have in my head. Do you remember anything like that? Um... What I remember about that was the father was civil, and he understood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he told his son this wasn't right. And that, like you saw that interaction? Yeah, and he said he was telling him that, he says, Mr. Honda has every right to go to the police because this shouldn't be happening. You know, yeah. and uh, the surprising thing was the mother came home, and she was kind So of we went inside? We were inside the house. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the mother was more, um, no, this, you know, my son wouldn't do. <laughs> and uh, so we said, I said, well, you know. Oh, yeah, I kind of, that rings a bell. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it, was, it was very strange. And, um, so, and it wasn't, you know, like you weren't yelling and screaming. You, oh, no. You were just explaining calmly. Yes. <laughs> yes. So it wasn't like you were an hysterical parent. Right, you were uh, careful and yeah measured in your description. Exactly, uh, I and, figured that and giving them the opportunity to to correct it and yeah. and not demanding anything and that's interesting. Yeah, I seem to remember something like that. I, I don't think it. I would have gotten the same kind of result if it was just the mom. If yeah. I was pounding on the door, ready to right. kick it, you know, or if the mom had asked. So, what was your understanding of the follow up on that? Do you, do you know what happened? Um. I, I think he, he pretty much just left you alone. He Yeah, he definitely yeah. left me alone. Yeah. But you don't remember 
what the dad said he was going to do to the kid. Because <laughs> in my head, I thought the dad, the vague memory I had was I had seen something that indicated maybe the dad was going to beat him. I hope that didn't happen, but... but you, you, you don't remember anything like... You, no. you would remember better than I would, because yeah. I, I was just a kid, but... Yeah, he obviously wasn't happy. Yeah. Uh, the something father. about... Yeah. But there was also something about the kid that indicated something was going on. I mean, that was always the case that I ran into because I was always a big kid, so people didn't really bully me. But there were kids that would try to mess with me. Mm. And there was this one kid, a new kid in the school, that he was big like me, and he started calling me racist terms, Mm -hmm. Asian slurs. And I'd had enough of his crap, and so I just turned around and just socked him as hard as I could in the stomach. And I had never punch someone you know with me and my friends we'd punch each other all the time like punching contests or fights or whatever and i had punched people in the stomach before and i'd been punched in the stomach before but i'd never punched someone in the stomach who wasn't ready for it and it was the weirdest feeling it felt like my fist went all the way back to his spine it was the weirdest feeling and he just dropped like a sack of potatoes and i'm like oh my god crap because I, I wanted to hurt him but i didn't want to destroy him like i just did and the teacher comes outside just then Mr. Brown, if you remember him, mm-hmm. yeah, and and says, "What's going on here?" And I'm like, "Crap, I'm, you know, I'm done." You could get expelled for yeah. being violent at school. And the bully, to his credit, he had the warrior code, and he said, "Nothing. I just fell." That's what he said. <laughs> and and I was like, "Oh my God!" Dodged a bullet. That th- he never called me another racial slur again. But um, but my my point is is that. Um, with with him, yeah, it, it... Oh, oh, my point is, is that I later found out that that kid had a very violent home. Mm. And so uh, there were other so-called bullies that I would discover that as well, that their, their home life wasn't going so well. So I just always wondered if that family had some issues. Yeah, a lot of times it's like you don't know what's going on. Did you see anything in that household? I'm no, just curious. Cause, no, Because, you know, that kid would bother Colleen as well. Yeah. Uh, and Mark would have to. Mark chased him down. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he had a track record of, yeah, of targeting people on the way to and from school. Yeah, unfortunately, and probably in your business, you probably can profile a lot of. Yeah, you, but know, you never like, saw anything about. I the, never the did, but or, um, there was in that neighborhood. There was a, f- a friend of mine that I worked with, and when I mentioned that family, that incident, he said, "Oh, yes, he, that." I guess he had a reputation around the neighborhood. The kid. Yeah. Yeah. And then eventually they moved, so I don't right. know what happened to him. But yeah. Um. So that's kind of sad. It was just him, as I recall. It was just. Uh, yeah, I think he had older siblings that weren't like that. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, there, there was something going on, and he didn't have any friends. He wasn't like a bully with a bunch of guys behind him. He wasn't like a Draco Malfoy who had. Yeah. Like, Tweedledee and Tweedledum behind him. He, it was just by himself, and he was easily repulsed by by people like my brother. You know, it wasn't like he had a gang. Well, it was like uh, he was smaller for his age, as I recall. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Um, what did you think when I decided to become a therapist? Well, obviously, for mom and I, it was uh, uh, a surprise, and uh, because we thought you were well into your. Um, business yeah yeah uh, that that this was where you wanted to go you were uh, well, all of our kids were blessed that they used both sides of their brain <laughs> the creative side and the uh, mathematical side um, you I, I always admired that all of you had that option of which way you wanted to go mm-hmm. um, was it weird though because I had never expressed interest in psychology or therapy before that point um, well, like I told you that, and you don't remember this, but when you were about third, third grade, maybe you told me that I said, dad, I says, yeah. And you said, I think I'm going to be, I think I'm going to be a, a minister. And I says, Oh, okay. Wow. And so, yeah, I know. Um, uh, and so from a young age, you had this obviously caring, it was, uh, you wanted to help people, I think. Huh. Yeah, I, I do remember thinking that when I was young. Yeah, and well... I, and my mission was to help people. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we had a, uh, a great minister to 
Harvey. Yeah. So I must have been influenced by Harvey to some extent. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 He was always approachable and, and always in a good mood and spoke well and um, took an interest in children and families. What's and, his last name? Um, <laughs> Pearson. Pearson. Yep. That's right. So, you know, mom said that when I told her I was going to be a therapist, she thought that, I don't know the way she put it, but she was surprised because she didn't think I had skills in that area, <laughs> well, <laughs> which I yet. totally get because I had done nothing in that arena, at least visibly. Yeah. So were you worried that I was making a weird choice? Because, you know, I was establishing myself in market research yeah. and a salary and a, a, yeah. a, I had an upward trajectory. and Correct. And I was throwing that all away to go back to graduate school to become a therapist of all things. Like the guidance man inside of you, did, did you have any concerns about that? Well, you always do. And, and just making sure that you're going to be okay. But, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, if it, he's going to go to school and, and he's thought about this, he always does, and basically he's going to more than likely follow through with it. Hmm. And I said, well, you know, if it doesn't work, you've, you've got that. Under you my belt, back. I have the business degree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what did you think as you saw me actually being a therapist? You know, you, I guess you would hear about my career as a therapist and a professor. I was a professor very quickly as well. Well, yes. Um, fortunately for, for you, Paul yeah. became your mentor. Yeah. And was it your first year in uh, like the third quarter? You taught a class? And I'm thinking... No, it was... I taught the term after I graduated was maybe I assisted some kind of class during... Yeah. I don't remember. But at the very least, I... Paul David was taking me under his wing. Correct. And at least at the time, he didn't have anyone else under his wing. And I don't know if he ever mentored anyone as much as he mentored me. And, and so, yeah, I guess that would be comforting to you because he, he had so much clout and power and prestige and, and, and connections. And, and to have someone that's watching over you like that, I imagine as a parent, you'd be like, well, at least he's got Paul in his quarter. Yeah. He was very instrumental in uh, helping you getting your PhD and yeah. Well, he he, uh, I mean, aside, I mean, I, I of course put a lot of effort into my early career as well, but a lot of the opportunities that I had were completely because of him. You know. Yeah. Um, what did you think when I started the podcast? Oh, that was new. Yeah. yeah. What what did you, what did you think? I, I probably like explained it to you at some point. What did you think about it? Um, 15 well, years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we would watch it on Facebook or, you know, I mean, and uh, it's been interesting to see uh, the direction that you've gone, how you've grown. And uh, mom and I were patrons and uh, we're, we're one of the deserved listeners. Yeah, and, and you listen to episodes. Yeah, at, definitely. At times. Yeah. Well, I'll end with this is just, dear listeners, my parents, like I was saying earlier, how my dad was always at every game, rain, snow, or shine, and it, it's it's literally everything I do. And I, you know, I'm doing so many things. Like I'm, I've been in various bands, even as a, as an adult. <laughs> um, we'll be playing some dive bar in Seattle that uh, Stacy doesn't even like stepping foot in. And not only my parents are there, but my aunts, aunts and uncles are there, and you know these. 78 year old people are sitting in places like the blue moon of all places if you're from seattle you know where the blue moon is and it's one of the grossest bars in seattle and well known for that and so not only that but you know you were there at my dissertation you're there at my various graduations you're there when i post an episode I would always joke that in the first couple of years of the podcast, I was like, well, I'm pretty sure only my parents are listening to this right now because you know we didn't have very many listeners back then, but I knew that at least my parents were paying attention. And so it just shows the, the dedication and the interest and the support and never any kind of complaining or any kind of, uh, I'm guessing even in your own mind, thinking like, I'd rather be doing something else, you know, because... Like, for those who know Rebecca, do you know my friend Rebecca? Yes. Mm -hmm. Her, she's talked about how 
she was talking about on the podcast about how her mom wasn't like that, that to get her mom's attention would be hard and, and her mom would complain or resist or not even notice, you know. And I think a lot of parents are like that, where whether it's pathological or not, it, it, I think parents can be self-centered or self-interested or distracted or confused or immature or something, you know, there's a certain level of maturity that, that I think grants a parent the willingness and the energy to, to give that attention to, to people, even when you're not, because, you know, I'm guessing you would never admit to this, but there's, I'm undoubtedly, there have been many times when you have been subjected to something that I was doing <laughs> and thinking, oh, this is not the most exciting thing that I could be doing with my time right now. I'd much rather be just at home watching TV or something else. Um, and yet you just always were there and you, you probably never even entertained those kind of thoughts. I don't know. But, and, and everyone around me has always noted this. When I was a kid, you know, playing football, my teammates would say, God damn, your dad is always there. He's always there. <laughs> I'm trying to get my parents to come to these things and they won't come. Your dad, your dad is always there. When we have shows with the various bands that I'm in, you know, Umberto will say, um, you know, I think, well, I don't know if I want to say this out loud, but let's just say I, I've had band members who have said that their family members have literally never been to one of their shows. And yet you have been to any show that I invite you to pretty much, you know, you've been to multiple shows. And so in and of itself isn't like the key to parenting, but it's a symptom of something. It's a, it's the tip of the iceberg of a dedication and a loyalty and a love and an attunement and a generosity that I think you should be able to take credit for. So the fact that you listen to the podcast and have since the very beginning, I think is is a testament to that. And I, I want to thank you for that, Dad. Well, it's, it's um, both ways. Um, we're, we feel fortunate to be able to um, go to these um, uh, venues um, when you're accepting awards or uh, performing. Um, uh, we feel like uh, we are maintaining our relationship with you. So, yeah. And we want to see you. We want to see um, yeah. your friends as yeah, well. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. You know my friends because you show yeah. up to these things. And my friends know you. Mm -hmm. And so you're integrated on that level. Yeah. It's not like this foreign thing that you're coming into it. You, you can enjoy it more because you know these people. You yes. Know? So that's, I think, unique. I, I don't know a lot of... I don't know if I know any of my bandmates who have ever had that. And I've been on a lot of bands with various people. I don't know if I know a single other bandmate that I've ever had that had parents that just were always just there, you know, mm -hmm. just enjoying themselves. Not begrudgingly, not like with one foot out the door, just like enjoying yourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. it's just like, yeah, it's, let's go see this. Let's, let's, let's see what the, even though it's 11.15 p.m. on a Tuesday, <laughs> let's do this. Well, I mean, it helps that we're all night owls in our family, but yeah. But anyway, so let's adjourn there. Thanks for coming down here. Yeah. And my uh, pleasure. And uh, what's one final thing you want to tell the listeners, Dad? Um, be aware that there's merch. We are looking at some of that ourselves. All of our our friends and family are very proud of all of our children, and and of course Kirk is involved here, and we're blessed to have him as our son. Thank you for having us. Um, Take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really do. <laughs> you know, the other night on YouTube, that famous song by Big Red or Red by Red. Big Red? Yeah, that guy that has long red hair. I don't know if I know this person. Would oh, I know them? It was maybe back in the 80s, 90s. Oh, uh, Simply Red. Simply Red. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, that song originally, without seeing him, I thought I was a woman. Oh, yeah, really high voice. He has such a pure voice. Holding back the tears. Yes. Yeah. And he just 
man, I'm a big fan of his now. I mean, I says, wow, what a pure voice that guy has. Yeah. 